There's just some ADPs, average draft positions, that are flat out wrong. And we're going to talk about them today here on the Audible Live. Cecil Lammy, Sigmund Blue, Matt Waldman is on assignment. And Sig, I get this idea from, well, just doing the news like we do every day at footballguys.com. And I'm writing about Antonio Gibson. Mm-hmm. Antonio Gibson, now Brian Robinson could get short yardage and goal line carries. J.D. McKissick is still there to get receiving work. And then I look at Gibson's ADP, and both of us love Gibson. We talked mm-hmm. plenty about a Gibson when he came out of college. I look at his ADP, it's running back 16, 306. Mm-hmm. You can get a Leonard Fournette or a J.K. Dobbins or Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, right around where you're going to yeah. get Antonio Gibson with many fewer questions so right let's talk about adps that are off and then we start with antonio gibson and there's a lot and there's no objective way to say what the right adp is but look again it's june well one more day of june uh we shouldn't be digging in our heels on any position on whether a player should be drafted or not but at the same time we can ascertain pretty well the range of outcomes. I mean, that's what we're spending time doing right now is thinking about the range of outcomes, putting in all the different factors of change. And there's just no way that you can look at Antonio Gibson and what he did last year and think that now granted he was playing hurt. The one plus here is he was playing hurt. So if he's healthy, well, we could see a better, more efficient per touch player, more explosive player, but all the other indicators are negative. Okay, so even if you decide those are a push, you still have a player last year that at best is a a running back two for your fantasy team. But if you are heeding the arrows pointing down, you have to think that he's going to be worth less than he was last year. And that means you can't justify where you're taking him. And see, I'm curious in general, I'll use Antonio Gibson as a larger topic that I'm just questioning. I'm not sure what to do with this because it's a different landscape. You know, see, st- people have been saying for years, running back doesn't matter. Don't overpay running backs. Don't put your running back second contract. Don't take running back in the first round. The NFL basically gets that. Look at the way they're treating running backs. Right. They, they get it. So what happens with lame duck running backs, right? What happens with Damian Harris and Roderick Stevenson? What happens with Dave Montgomery and Khalil Herbert? What happens with Saquon Barkley? And well, I don't even know who's going to be behind him. Deshaun Corbin. Uh, maybe Saquon Barkley is a bad example because he actually has a competent offensive coaching staff around him now. Maybe that applies to Dave Montgomery. I don't know. But the point is, in an era when teams, Josh Jacobs and Vegas, in an era when teams move on from running backs pretty quickly, what happens when a team, when they've looked down the road, has already decided this player is probably not in our future? And I, I'm not sure what to say, but even though Antonio Gibson's only in his third year of his rookie contract, the drafting of Brian Robinson, the vibes, don't tell me that they think what, we're trucking with Antonio Gibson into this horizon, right? So I, it's I, ADP, no ADP questions. I don't want to get players on my team that the team they're on feels that way about them. Right. Well, the team's already making the decisions. Like you could tell the way that they're drafting, the way that they're picking people up and the way that they're just kind of dragging their feet with running back. So you can love a player. You can root for a player. You also have to understand what's going on around said right. player. And with Antonio Gibson, it was just like, if you're not getting red flags and alarms going off when you're thinking about Gibson, especially compared to those around him, and we're going to get to the, some right. of those backfield situations, Bloom. I think it's just, um, it's not paranoia. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is what is the old saying? Uh, if you think the government is watching you, well, that's going in your file. Right. Uh, if you think YouTube is monitoring your channel so you don't see curse words, that's going in your file. See, I like uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. <laughs> uh, so a paranoia is what they describe as a keen awareness of one's surroundings. Mm-hmm. Bloom, let's mm-hmm. just let people know about the paranoia around some of these players. Yeah, well, and it's interesting that you got to the source of that word. I love language. I love looking at origins of language. I love understanding what the origin of a word is. And meanings slip and maybe a word used to mean something and then it becomes something else by the way it's used. But I think it's interesting that we associate paranoia with fear, but really it just means awareness. Well, what does that say about, and there's a Freudian take there. But I, I do think that, again, as you said, just to put a bow on Gibson, um, the player can always overcome. And sometimes the negative, the struggle, like think of us as human beings, struggle creates overcoming. 
um, sometimes, and sometimes struggle creates defeat. But Gibson can overcome the struggle. Gibson can internalize all this and become a new guy and really hit his peak as a player. It's not impossible that this turns out to be a story for fantasy terms, at least. Jeez, we just can't say happy ending anymore on fantasy football shows, can we, see? So it's another thing got ruined. No. Contagious is ruined now. There's so many words that are ruined, right. uh, speaking of language. But my point is it can be a good story if you take Antonio Gibson, if it's just Antonio Gibson, the player who can overcome, but when there's all these other environmental factors, and that's what we're looking at with running backs. See, he's always thought running backs are like frogs, right? Like they absorb their environment more than other positions, which means a mediocre talent can be a great fantasy player in a good situation, and a great talent, Najee Harris, can be maybe brought down a little bit by their situation. We'll see. So I, I think these are the things that we're trying to maybe not take a hard stand on right now, but at least understand all the considerations before we make that decision in August when we're drafting. Well, what do we always talk about in the off season and we'll be talking about in preseason watch list, which are coming up at the end of July. Although bloom, I think we need to start recording them next week. That's an yeah. off air conversation, but what do we always talk about? Drum beats. This is just a drum beat. Pay attention to the drum beats. Listen for the drum beats. Watch and, and listen. Keep your ears up on what's going on this time of year. Know who to listen to, which beat reporters to listen to with mm -hmm. each team, and then understand what they're saying. So I want to ask you, since you're down there in New Orleans, yeah. the hell's going on with Alvin Kamara? Because yeah. I look at his average draft position, right? And there's uh, what's funny is a lot of these guys we're going to talk about are kind of clustered mm -hmm. closer together. Mm -hmm. We just talked about... Uh, what you're going to get with Gibson, RB16, 306 right now, 12 team PPR. Well, Alan Kamara's RB8, 111. Yeah, right. it, yeah. It's as he's being drafted as if nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Well, look, with Kamara, to answer your first question, what's going on is the team is prepping to be without him for six games, let's say. Uh, let's just put that out there as like a median number. They're going to make a move at running back. I mean, that's the expectation. They do have Mark Ingram. They do have Divine Ozigbo. They have Abram Smith. You know, Dwayne Washington's still on the roster. But there's going to be somebody else brought in. And with respect to Kamara, first of all, it wasn't really noted last year that after they brought Mark Ingram back, that he they went back to the old Kamara-Ingram backfield split. And in an offense that's not a Drew Brees offense, that wasn't really a James Winston offense after Winston got hurt either. But still... This is not that offense that when you're creating two near running back ones, especially because, you know, Mark Ingram's not that guy anymore. Uh, and it's just not – Kamara was like running back two. I mean, Kamara was not the elite first-round pick value once Ingram joined the team. So you're already having that not factored in cease. Forget about the suspension. All right. But then you get to the six-game suspension. Where is DeAndre Hopkins going now with a six-game suspension? Sixth, seventh round. I, mean, I can't say like specifically, but he's fallen significantly. So even now in Hopkins, we can talk about this separately. Do you think Hopkins goes back to being Hopkins, or at least what he was last year when he's, yeah, he's back? He's wide receiver 16, 405 right now. 405. Okay. Well, you're going to take so, him over Michael Pittman? No. You're going to take him no, over Jalen no. Waddle? No. Deontay Johnson? No. No. I mean, look, you know. 405 sounds, I mean, four, I mean, fifth, maybe fifth round. There's a lot of potential landmines in the fourth round of wide receiver. That's a different discussion. But my point is, if we think that the starting value for Hopkins and the starting value for Kamara is, are similar, factoring in that Kamara last year, once Ingram was on the team, was not a running back one, not an elite first round pick level play, then Kamara should at least fall to the fourth round. But there's also another thing going on here too, Cease. And the Saints line is still pretty good. And Jameis Winston is still going to be pretty good. And the offense is going to be a lot better, even if Michael Thomas is you know damaged goods forever um but might be the answer here is just none of the above because i want it to be abram smith we'll see who they bring in divino zigbo is still i am 100 percent giving up on him but this may end up being a situation where just trying to decipher it and pick anybody out ends up being uh, a fool's errand as they say a fool's errand, as they often say. It is the Audible Live, Cecil Lamy and Sigma Bloom. We're talking about top five ADPs that are just flat out wrong. <laughs> We're here to tell you. It's a little bit more nuanced, Bloom, as you so beautifully and eloquently put. But uh, you can get some clues. You can get some details. And you brought them up. Let's talk about David Montgomery. Now, not necessarily because of the news cycle. And as I look over our newswire at footballguys.com, and for those of you that don't know or are new to the channel, one, welcome. Make sure to hit the like, comment, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but Bloom and I do the news for football guys. So we go over the news stories. We write the little blurbs that are football guys views. Our boss, Joe Bryant, kicks in as well. And we give it to you in a newsletter every single day that's free. It's kind of an in introduction. I've always called our newsletter, Bloom, the handshake for football yeah. guys. Right. Like, here, here you go. Here's our handshake. Here's what uh, we're about. And, uh, you know, it's free. So check us out. And if you like us, then subscribe. And thank you very much for subscribing. Um, but it's not necessarily because of the news cycle. It's just because Khalil Herbert's that damn good. Mm -hmm. Right? Go over the Bears newswire right now. There's not much about Dave Montgomery or any sort of split or any sort of timeshare or whatever. Maybe there's a little bit on Khalil Herbert. I'm, I'm browsing it right now. It's mm -hmm. mainly about, like, uh, Justin Fields or... Darnell Moody now uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, there was a, you know, uh, head coach Matt Eberfluss says David Montgomery fits the new offense really well. Well, yeah, so does Khalil Herbert mm -hmm. and Herbert might be better. So when Montgomery's going at RB 13 to 11 and again, right around Joe Mixon and Aaron Jones, I would way rather have Aaron Jones and Joe Mixon. Montgomery's going right around. There's Zeke again. There's Antonio Gibson again. There's Barkley again. So here's Dave Montgomery again, talented. We love him. We love his game. Khalil Herbert's too damn good to ignore. The offense is better. Herbert's going to be better. Keeping Montgomery fresh. Again, it's kind of just the way the whole discussion boils down to what you said in the first five minutes, Bloom. Yeah. Good night. That's the show, everybody. It's basically how teams are treating running backs. Right. Right. I mean, and, you know, the Bears, this regime, this brand new regime, I mean, maybe they haven't brought in his replacement. OK, but when we saw Khalil Herbert last year, if you're being honest, you can't say that Montgomery looked like a better runner than Herbert. And that's not to take away from Montgomery. It's to say that Herbert, when he got his chance, showed that he fits in on an NFL field. Uh, maybe there's some sort of veteran starter perception deference to Montgomery and he still gets the kind of workload that he did last year uh but then you also get into Chicago and see this is where it's a real riddle because I think the positive potential for Chicago's offense is that they were working against Matt Nagy they were trying to the whole team was trying to row upstream against Matt Nagy and when you take that away, and I think this applies to the Giants, I think it applies to Jacksonville, what is going to be the effect when you just have a coaching staff, hopefully, and obviously we'll see on the reveal, at least early on, and this can also be something that kicks in year two, right? I'm always a year early. That's one of my biggest blind spots as a fantasy analyst, a year early. So maybe this analysis really should apply to these to the players in these offenses. No, says that the players in these offenses, because who knows who's going to be in these offenses in 2023, right? Uh, but certainly... It, it, this year it applies to Mitchell Trubisky and an implication a little bit to Pittsburgh. It applies to Allen Robinson, right? Uh, if you think Matt Nagy was just holding, or obviously Justin Fields, if you think Matt Nagy was just holding everything back, then that should create some uplift for this offense. But if you look at the personnel, it's like a, a horror movie. I mean, how are you? This is going to be, um, I mean, Byron, I don't take anything from Byron Pringle. I don't take anything away from Felix Jones or Cole Komet, but this is, I suppose you leverage Justin Fields running ability. And that could be something that helps Dave Montgomery too, is if you do some more things to leverage Fields mobility, then you rub, you're rubbing two sticks together and you can make something happen. But I, I just don't know how with this personnel, you can expect it at least to happen right away. Or you can expect it to happen, say, in the first season of the first half of the season, and you see Chicago opening up against the San Francisco and Green Bay defenses. Now, maybe you swoop in when they get Houston Giants the next couple of weeks after that. Maybe week three, we're talking about Dave Montgomery as a buy low, Darnell Mooney as a buy low. But I want players to be able to overachieve if I'm taking them, right? That's that up higher part of the range of outcomes and i think as they like to say in fantasy circles i think montgomery's being drafted at his ceiling and that means the adp is probably off mm -mm -mm. someone's gonna get to blame <laughs> uh yeah. maybe it just hurts him the way miles sanders was hurt i was writing oh, about sanders man. yesterday and it's like sanders didn't score any touchdowns uh, like i'm in the jerry judy world right because it is a bronco yeah. show bloom so it's like Jerry Judy didn't score any touchdowns. He sucks. Like, man, he doesn't suck. Kenny Galladay didn't score any touchdowns. Well, neither did Miles Sanders last year. 
Uh, now that was largely due to Jordan Howard and Jalen Hurts. So maybe Montgomery's hurt, not necessarily by Herbert as much as, well, maybe Fields runs more. Yeah, and there could be fantasy success. I mean, look, we always have situations where NFL success and fantasy success diverge, right? And the Bears could go three and fourteen, but Fields uh, and the way that Jalen Hurts was racking up fantasy points in the first half of the year last year, even though the Eagles. It wasn't helping the Eagles win games. It was helping fantasy teams win games. It's possible. It's possible that Darnell Mooney, just as the default number one receiver, especially with garbage time, works out. But this goes back to the show I did with Andrew Erickson, catcher rising star. Just draft players in good offenses. There's just no scenario where the Bears are a good offense. Maybe they're not as bad, but that doesn't mean they're good. Right. It is the Audible Live, and why are people drafting Clyde edwards alaire Bloom? Like, seriously, I look at his average draft position, and it's RB22, and it's 409. So near the end of the fourth round in 12-team PPR, you're passing on maybe a James Conner or a Josh Jacobs or a Travis Etienne, right? Cam Akers staring at you in the face. There's Damian Harris, who we talked about earlier. A.J. Dillon we're going to talk about in just a little bit. So you've got all this talent around him, and you're going to take a guy that never does it. In an offense, now it's a good offense, okay, but Clyde edwards helaire has never been the answer that the Chiefs hoped for and certainly Mahomes hoped for when he opened his mouth and told Andy Reid to go get this guy. Yeah, I'm a little bullish on him. Now, granted, fourth round is a little different proposition. I'm seeing him fall to the sixth round. Uh, and at that point, I think it's almost absurd. It's the point where... There's this adjustment that happens, right? What did you think of first round Clyde edwards helaire as a rookie? I made this speech on my show or someone's show recently. What do you think of first round Clyde edwards helaire the rookie? Oh, it was a disaster, right? Like just a total disaster. What do you think of third round Clyde edwards helaire the second year player? Again, felt disappointing, right? Felt disappointing. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have more information here. Again, he had his gallbladder taken out. His weight went down to, I think, 160, 165 pounds in the offseason. He wasn't able to prepare. I mean, maybe I'm not Dr. Gene Bramwell, but I am thinking that when you don't get to have, when you have an offseason where you're just coming back from something most of that offseason, you might not be yourself the following year. But here's the thing. If you look a little bit closer at what Clyde edwards helaire did, don't think about, and now there's the games he missed. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's a different. I don't think people are saying fade Clyde Edwards Hilaire because he's injury prone, right? I don't hear that a lot. What did he do last year? Uh, first week, 1443, three for 29. The next week, uh, 13 for 46. Okay, this is this is this is the narrative of, you know, he was a big disappointment last year, but wait a second. Against the Chargers, he had 17 for 100 and caught a touchdown pass. The next week against the Eagles, he had 14 for 102 and also caught a touchdown pass. Wait a second. That sounds like a good fantasy running back. Then he got hurt. Comes back against Dallas, 12 for 63 and a touchdown. Catch two passes for 13, 14 for 54, three for 28. Against Vegas, he scores two touchdowns. That's a good game. Uh, against the Chargers, second time, not so good. Against the Steelers, at least he scores a touchdown and then he's hurt again. So you run the numbers a little more than half the time. He was a running back one last year even though it's been thought of as a disaster. Now, is that what you wanted for a third round pick? Cause he missed it like half the games. You probably look back and you felt like he was disappointing last year, but now at a six round price tag, or maybe a fifth round price tag where you only take one running back in the first four rounds and you need that running back to hit because the other side of this cease is we spent a lot of time thinking about Kansas city and the receivers, which receiver is it going to be right? right. Valdez Scantling, Juju, Sky Moore. Is it Michael Hardman? <laughs> maybe, uh, but why can't it be Clyde edwards Elaire? Clyde edwards Elaire? Why can't he be one of the answers to where's this slack get taken up that's left by Tyreek Hill? So I think you add that in, that edwards Elaire was better than you thought last year for fantasy, and he's cheaper, much cheaper than he was last year, and that he might become a bigger part of the offense. Let's give, maybe we're getting too impatient with rookies, right? Maybe we're getting too impatient with players on the rookie contract. We'll see, but I'll take that plunge in the fifth or sixth round for Edward D. Lair, assuming that, uh, and notice I haven't mentioned Ronald Jones once, right. assume, <laughs> <laughs> assuming that it fits in my team build. Well, Chris brought up Jet, Jet McKinnon. 
So yeah. there you go. Uh, you know. Well, hey, look, if so, here's an article idea I toy with every year, and I was thinking about it again this morning, Cease, which is the, like the personality test, right? Like, if you won't take Christian McCaffrey in the top five because you think he's going to get hurt again, then you better take Dante Foreman in the fifteenth round or later, right? If you don't think Clyde Edwards Lair is going to mount to anything, and you're like, I don't even want him in the sixth round, then you better be on Ronald Jones or Jarek McKinnon or somebody because it's as we saw in the playoffs, it's going to make somebody fantasy relevant. It's going to do something. Hey, yeah. do something. The Chiefs. Yeah, it's the Chiefs. Of course, they're going to do something. And uh, we're going to watch and see exactly what that is. I, I would say this, Bloom, to counter your point. Yeah. I don't mind being impatient with running backs. If you don't show it immediately, Thomas Jones happened That's once. That's okay. Fair. Thomas Jones happened once. And uh, for those who don't remember, former first-round pick. Wasn't he top 10 for Arizona? Thomas Jones coming out of Virginia. And he didn't do anything with Arizona, gets cut or traded or whatever, winds up in Tampa for half a season and actually like flashes, you know, at like 500 yards in six games or whatever, and then goes on to rush for a thousand yards like six times, whatever the number is. Like Thomas Jones got it like four years into his career. Uh, so you had that first round talent and then finally things came together for him five years later. I don't think in today's NFL with the way running backs are getting treated that that happens anymore. Like if you come in, if you don't show it now, I'm not necessarily tossing you on a scrap heap, but yeah. I'm definitely going to be a little bit a wide receiver. You know what I mean? Like I mm -hmm. just brought up Jerry Judy. It's year three for Jerry Judy. Go back and look at year one and year two for Cooper cup. They weren't what they are now. I'm not saying that Jerry Judy's Cooper cup. Cause of course he's not, but Wide receiver, I'm going to give you three years. Tight end, I'm going to give you three years. Running back, if you don't show it like now, now, I sound like uh, <laughs> I sound like the cop in Die Hard when his uh, car's getting all uh, shot up. Turn by my car Bruce to Willis. Swiss cheese. Right. Turn my car to Swiss cheese. I have backup now. Now. Sorry, Joe. Now. Anyway, yeah, so running back is a little bit different from Yeah, well, and it, this cuts both ways, right? Because this is also, again, is a Ronald Jones take. Like Ronald Jones, by that analysis, is not going to be much of a threat to Edward Dillaire, but maybe Edward Dillaire is also not going to be much. But also, I think it spells out Kenneth Walker. Someone asked in the chat room earlier, Kenneth Walker or Rashad Penny. You know, if your theory is Rashad Penny was struck by lightning and got it last year, yeah, uh, maybe not so much. Now, we did put people on alert. Was it Fantasy Fellowship? I'm trying to look back in the... Uh... Uh, in the chat right there. Yeah, here it comes. Here it comes, Fantasy Fellowship, because this morning in the newsletter that, again, Joe Bryant puts together, me and Sigmund write the takes, it was about A.J. Dillon. It was about the Green Bay situation. And if you look, A.J. Dillon's role to expand, mm -hmm. quote, and question mark. The Packers gave Dillon 221 touches, but he can handle much more. Expect his role to expand. There's a good chance Dillon and Jones, Aaron Jones, will handle 500 or more total touches in 2022. So that gets me to look at, well, where's Jones going? Where's Dylan going? Mm -hmm. Jones is going at RB11, 205. Dylan's going at RB26, 508. Again, this is 12-team PPR. And I'm like, well, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> if the team and the Packers is very interesting about the Packers, yeah. like what are they going to do? They've got trash wide receivers. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, 100 years old. You know, uh, he doesn't look like John Wick. I know, like, for Halloween, he's like, I'm going to dress up like John Wick. Like, dude, you look like John Wick's grandfather, who somehow mysteriously must have just stayed at the hotel, like, right? Uh, just got room service all day and then, like, never left the hotel so he couldn't get hurt. Spoiler alert for John Wick. But anyway, like, okay, how do you protect Aaron Rodgers? Maybe give Jones 250 touches and A.J. Dillon 250 touches, which means this ADP, honestly, for both of them is wrong. Probably for both of them. I mean, it's possible Jones can return second round value and Dylan can return third round value or second round value. Uh, reason that and second round, you know, who my guys, I think is going to end up being in the second round after all seats. I think it's mm. going to be, I think it's going to be Mike Evans. I think it's going to be Mike Evans. Okay. It was CD lamb for a little bit. I'm okay with folks. If Barkley's your guy in the second round, you know, uh, but Aaron Jones is okay in the second round too. Here's why Aaron Jones is okay in the second round. This is the aspirational version uh, in CEH, Edwards E. Lair, that with Aaron Jones, we already have this, right? We already know that if the Packers just allow it to happen, Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Jones make beautiful music in the passing game, right? 
What happens with Devontae Adams? Who fills the void? And there's a question about Alan Zard. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with spending a 20th round pick on Randall Cobb. I'm okay with taking Robert Tunyon. Good positive things about his uh, coming back from ACL. Maybe he'll be the first of the three players coming back from an ACL to get back on the field. So that's all positive. But Aaron Jones is the guy that we already know when the Bulls are flying. Uh, Rodgers and Jones can hook up. So especially if you think there's going to be struggle in the passing game without Devontae Adams. We could get to, with Aaron Jones, see, we could get to Austin Eckler levels. It's possible. Uh, he doesn't, if 250 touches, if um, 80 or those are catches, we're in business, baby. And with A.J. Dillon, if he's getting the goal line carries, we're also in business. So maybe the answer is both. And I think we talked about Kansas City and we talked about Green Bay. And I think your homework or on your to-do list for fantasy drafts this year is to decide where you want to put your chip in those offenses. Because, yes, there's a big hole that stoppers out of the bathtub. Some of the water's draining out with Hill and Adams gone. Okay, but we believe enough in Mahomes and Rodgers that not a lot is going to go down the drain that they're still going to make these offenses good fantasy offenses simply by their resourcefulness in their game. So there are going to be overachievers. Cause I think the ADP for these offenses, especially Kansas city is anticipating it, whether it's consciously or not, it, it's there's no longer the shine around chiefs players. Right. And there should be shine around Packers players. And I think that Aaron Jones has that to an extent. Uh, Dylan doesn't have it yet. And I'll, I'll close by saying this season, A.J. Dillon and Tony Pollard are my favorite kind of picks. They're league winners. And they are actually going to be league winners. I don't know. But the, when we get to see these guys play, they are good. And there's, especially in the case of Pollard, there might just be factors that no matter how good they are, the obstacles aren't going to get removed. And they're going to continue to be a tease in fantasy. But if it happens, the metaphor I always use is the powder and the flame. Dillon and Pollard, if these guys can get 250 touches, then they can be the winners. So I'm not going to talk anybody out of taking them as high as even the, in Dylan's case, the fourth round in Pollard's case, the sixth round, because they are the players that can make your draft. Mm. Pixar didn't happen. Devin in our chat room says I'm literally working out while I listen to this. Wow. It's like, oh, well, Pixar didn't happen, right? Everyone that goes to the gym, you gotta, you gotta take those picks. Bloom, that's why I don't post any picks. <laughs> Although I do have a bunch for Instagram coming up a little bit later. Oh, like good. I've been holding back on quite a few things just because of uh, busy making comic books. Like, mm. I don't know if anybody can see this. Yeah, you can see a little bit of it. That's yeah, page yeah. one of uh, Fake Booze, which mm -hmm. is coming very, very, very soon. And uh, we'll be in the rocks, hot little hand here next month. And then uh, available to you out there. So uh, I got a lot of stuff coming on Instagram. So not a lot of working out because I'm working out my typing, drawing. I don't know. Whatever it is. Anyway, uh, it is the Audible Live. Enough comic book talk. Let's talk about, well, what everybody is talking about in the chat room. Because you mentioned getting, you know, a Tony Pollard, right? As your favorite. Mm. What if I were to tell you, Bloom? Mm -hmm. It sounds like the beginning of a 30 for 30. Yeah. What if I were to tell you that there's a running back you can draft in the 10th round when you're getting handcuffs that could win your league is at least an RB2? What if I told you that? Would you, it's, Who's that old guy in Entourage? Does that sound like something you'd yeah. be interested in? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Does that and sound I sound like something you'd be interested in because I got yeah, one. Yeah, I can believe it. I can believe it, Cease. And I'll let you do your reveal first. But I think that that part of the draft, especially if you do a coordinated draft around certain backfields, could be very fruitful. Very, very fruitful. Now, we'll see. We'll see if you're a smile or a frown. Where does this rate on the bloom scale? Because it's Kenneth Walker. Mm -hmm. It's the Seattle situation. Yeah. Like, Chris Carson is getting drafted ahead of Kenneth Walker right now. That's just stupid. Like, God bless Chris Carson, but neck injuries, they, they take out everybody. Sterling Sharp, neck injury, done. Eric Dickerson, neck injury, done. Smoke Dog Al Wilson, neck injury, done. There's zero timetable on Chris Carson's. Chris Carson's never going to play football again, or at least he shouldn't. You want to play football with a neck injury? Right. Like, with that risk on the line of losing the ability to do whatever from your neck, like... No, Chris Carson should never be allowed to play football again. Sorry, it's over. Rashad Penny. Right. Dude, it's a San Diego State player that I wasn't excited about. 
Okay. Right. When what's his ass? Who's the the tight end? Gavin Escobar. Uh, Escobar. Who's the other one that just got cut from like the Saints or whatever? Um, Hakuna Matata. Uh, whatever the guy's name was, uh, uh-huh. just got cut from the Saints. I was like, if it's a San Diego State player that I don't like, Holly Waring. Yes. There you go. There you go. What did I say? Hakuna Matata. <laughs> That's okay, because the vowels, the concentration of vowels helped me. That was a clue. <laughs> okay, okay, it was a clue. All right, I got it. Um, but either way, like, uh, just uh, it, it, it's it's not going to happen with yeah. Rashad Penny. It did. It, you got it for a little never bit. Never say never, but you got it last year. Not. Yeah. You know, you won your league last year if you had Rashad Penny, and at the end of the season, I get it. Okay, but that's. That was then. This is now. I'm picking up Kenneth Walker in the 10th yes. round all yes. day. Yes, 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 yes. And there is an opportunity. And again, I want everyone to stay healthy forever and ever and ever. But there's an opportunity that Kenneth Walker takes over the starters week two. Right. What do you Before get from a talented back in week two that's got probably Geno Smith or as a mm-hmm. starter? Mm-hmm. Did you see what KJ Wright said? He said, don't give me yes. Baker Mayfield. I don't uh, want Drew Locke. Give yeah, me Geno right. Smith. So right. they're going to do this is Pete Carroll's wet dream. Can mm-hmm. I at least say that? <laughs> Sorry, Joe, for bringing that up. But like, this is Pete Carroll being like, we're gonna, just going to run all the run, run, run and punt. That's what they're going to do. So it's going to be three carries for Kenneth Walker, and then they're going to punt. They're going to get it back. So Kenneth Walker is that guy that you can get in the 10th round. So his ADP, maybe it's not wrong, Bloom, the topic of today's show. Mm-hmm. Top five ADPs that are wrong. Well, maybe it's right on the money for you. It'll be wrong at the end of the year. But it's right on the money for you. Well, look, again, um, here's a way that you can say it's wrong if we're just going to do real high-level, broad analysis. How many times does a running back that was taken top 50 in the NFL draft go in the 10th round of a fantasy draft? I'm sure that we can probably look at running backs taken in the second round, let's say, Cease. And we could probably find that ADP reflects, well, the quality of the situation around them. Like A.J. Dillon is a good example of a second rounder that we weren't interested in his rookie year, right? Well, it was because of Aaron Jones. Rashad Penny's not Aaron Jones, right? Just being able to get, whether it's eighth, ninth, tenth round, the point is a bench pick. When you're starting to fill out your bench to get Kenneth Walker, to me, that's a low-hanging fruit. Now, it does go against the idea of taking players in good offenses, but at least if you're going to be in a bad offense, be aligned with what the point of that offense is, what the emphasis of that offense is, and boy, it is mm-hmm. to run. And Cease, uh, the worst-case scenario here is a split backfield, right, where you can't count on Walker or Penny. But if one of the running backs is going to get hurt or otherwise fade and make the other one allow, to, to allow them to take over the backfield, that's not going to be Walker fading for Penny. That's going to be Penny fading for Walker. But the point here also is you start to look at backfield seats and you look at the draft capital, fantasy draft capital that is invested in a backfield and you look at ADP. And you can see that almost every backfield is going to cost you, what, a fourth, fifth round pick, maybe Philadelphia with Miles Sanders and all that. I mean, he's telling us it's going to be a committee. That makes sense, right? Um, Houston, who wants a Houston back? Okay, that makes sense. But then we start to add up the sum of the ADP, what it would take to corner a backfield, if you will, like Monopoly. Like we're going to build hotels on the Seattle backfield. It's cheap, right? You know another offense that's cheap to corner the backfield? It's not a bad offense. It's a great offense. Buffalo. Buffalo. You're telling me, I mean, Demi, Devin Singletary, James Cook, you can lock these guys up. So, see, I'm okay with a game plan. If you go into a draft, you take your favorite running back in the first or second round, whoever you're most sure about with your whatever draft slot. Just take one running back in the first two rounds. In the eighth, ninth, tenth, take Walker, Singletary, and Cook. You're probably going to get a running back, two out of that group. Maybe two. And for some reason, the, I don't know if we're still in the past where, like, Buffalo shanks all the running back picks or Buffalo's not going to commit to one running back, or Buffalo's offense isn't going to create fantasy chance for running backs. Like, if you paid attention last year, at the end, Devin Singletary was a running back one. Once they just said, Zach Moss ain't going to happen. And I get it. James Cook is there. Um, if you think James Cook is going to hit, he and Singletary can both hit. Cook can play in the slot. Cook can break some big plays out of spread formations. Singletary can still be the guy that knows the offense and still handles like 60% of the snaps. Give me a running back on the field for 60% of snaps to the Bills. They're going to be fantasy relevant. The offense is that good. So that's another back foot I'm looking at, and it just doesn't add up that it's so cheap to get the two most important members of it. 
Mm-mm-mm. It is the Audible Live. Cecil Lammy and Sigmund Bloom here for you. And we want to make sure you do those YouTube things. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that you never miss a vid. Sigmund, I did not go to the Avs parade. Oh. So I could be here with you, man. Because oh. I was like, okay, oh, okay. we got to do the Audible. I knew Matt was on assignment. So I was like, okay, we got to do the Audible. And it was supposed to be Tuesday. Uh, but they couldn't close the deal at home last Friday. Oh, spent like 10 G's on his tickets, dude. Wow. Hey, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. He was sitting I, uh, I don't know if you saw Vaughn. Vaughn was there with McManus. Mm. And I can't cheer on. Uh, well, I guess I could on this channel. I'll, I'll say this on the on the air and I'll leave it uh, vague. Uh -oh. On the air, I cheered on the Broncos kicker. And, uh, you know, I got in trouble for it. So they're like, please don't say let's go Brandon McManus again. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, sure, fine, that's fine. So I, you know, I can't cheer on Brandon McManus, Brandon McManus, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but him and Vaughn were there. I don't know if you saw like chugging beer, right? Mm -hmm. At game five, O was sitting behind him. Mm. 10 G's for his tickets. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, and then they lost. <laughs> yeah. So then they won on Sunday. See, that's. Now look what's happened to me, Bloom, all these years. Now I'm talking hockey. Yeah, it's good. Is Bo Byram the youngest stud in the NHL? What a set of defensemen they have there. Uh, Kale McCarr? Look yeah. At that. Devin Don't even Taze. know what that means. Yeah, it's great. I love hockey. I love, I'm really discovering my love of all the professional sports. Remember, my dream was to be the play-by-play -play announcer for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And as a separate aside, sees, I, don't, I haven't had a chance to tell you about this. Like We're way down the fantasy rabbit hole in my home right now because the love of my life kate is a baseball fanatic now and we're putting in lineups on the top spun app and it's just like the thing and she's like she's coming to me like why didn't anybody tell me june carlo stanton was gonna be scratched you know <laughs> she got like the fantasy <laughs> the fantasy you know jones uh it, it's great and i'm loving baseball see i'm gonna spend ten thousand dollars to go behind and play and watch show otani pitch you know He's like mm -hmm. uh, 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 Haley's Comet. That's like a tr be beautiful. Yes. It's like baseball had a baby and his name is Shoei. You know, mm -hmm. like he, he's straight from the source of baseball. You don't get to see that very often. Um, I don't even know what we were talking about, Cease, because now I'm in La La Land. Avs so. parade today. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and look, congratulations to Avalanche. And I see it as a good story, the overcoming. You know, what would they have, 48 points like uh, five years ago? They were terrible. And Joe Sackick, maybe there's a little love for the Quebec Nordiques. I want to see a Canadian team get to lift the cup. Um, I guess I'll close by this say, with this cease, because you're talking about cheering. I was thinking about something else. There was a few people in our community saying uh, there was one writer from uh, Denver who was lifting the cup like triumphantly. Yeah, it was Mike Chambers. And Gabe Landis gave him the cup. Yeah. And so everyone's making it a controversy. Dude, I know like a dozen media members. My buddy... <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what my buddy's job is uh, later, but I got one of my close friends that drank out of the cup. Yeah, well, and look, I'm like, no... listen, everybody's drinking out of the damn cup. I might be able to drink out of the cup, Bloom, if I go to the right party. Yeah, and it's, I think that there's no superstition about touching the cup. Uh, you're not supposed to touch the, some people, that you're not supposed to touch the conference channel. But when a beat trophy. writer that's with those guys every day drinks out yeah, of the and cup. And it's sports, and cease, it's sports. It's not geopolitics, right? You're ruining the profession. You're damaging the profession by showing you're not impartial. It's sports. It's sports. Yes, there are areas of journalism where being impartial is important, but not sports journalism. The people of a city don't have an entitlement to the real. I mean, like, it's okay when a team, when the people you're with every day experience something to be part of that cathartic outpouring and maybe even have, like, a kinship with them because you you travel the same circles as them and you go through the same things. And, uh, yeah, so I'm proud of the Avalanche for getting over the hump. And the, let's say also hats off to the Tampa Bay Lightning, who not just won the last two cups, but were always either in the, the conference championship or even the Stanley Cup finals. I mean, this has been a, a, a dynasty for hockey people out there on the level of like the 80s Islanders or, or Oilers. Uh, if they had won this cup somehow, they were just tired. I think the team just ran out of gas. Yeah. And the Avalanche had to overcome, and they did overcome. And I'm still a little burned about the Penguins losing to the Rangers too, but that's for another show. <laughs> that is for another show all right there is i can't believe it bloom we did it yeah. we actually talked other than you bringing it up i used to get mad when you'd like bring up some 
Hey, the Penguins are in the State of the Cup final. I'd be like rolling my eyes. There are other things than football, Cecil Lammy. No, it's good, though. I mean, I'm sure that it was really positive for the city. Uh, I know that it it, it certainly is is something that we need. Boy, do we need it. Boy, do we need something else to think about. Anything else. And like you said, it's geopolitics, and people are upset about Mike Chambers, who's a nice guy. Like, listen, you go through that with a team. You're on the road with a team. You're a beat writer. Yeah. Of course they're going to, there's no objectivity. You should be worried about the propaganda that's fed you on a daily basis. Anytime someone's like, why'd you guys take so long to start on the audible? It's like, well, there's stuff going on. <laughs> Bloom and I got to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. And I guess one, that's one thing that I can make a nod to without, uh, you know, going into detail, which is I saw something today. Somebody put out there, like, don't, don't beat yourself up for being lazy. Tell yourself that you're exhausted because life is hard, you know? Be, take it easy on yourself. I need that advice more than anybody, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But um, I said this on another show. I think maybe it was Pat Fitzmorris' show. I don't remember. They all run together. Um, like as a country, and I, and look, the source of the trauma might be different for you than it is for somebody else. But we all are going through trauma. We're all traumatized. We're all in pain. We're all in pain right now. And it's now more than ever, we need compassion or cease. We need to find again that common link, that common humanity. Meet in the middle. Someday and, the pre show or the after show is going right. to be the show. Yeah. But that, yeah. that day's not yet today. And, and I think that sports actually is, you know, it was really funny, cease. I, for some reason, uh, we were talking earlier. And I was remembering that scene in The Simpsons whenever first it's this is episode when George H.W. Bush moves in across the street. And then at the end of the end, they have problems, George H.W. and Homer. And then at the end of the ga- end of the episode, Gerald Ford moves in. He's like, do you like football? Homer's like, yeah. Do you like nachos? Homer's like, yeah. <laughs> and they're friends. Right. <laughs> and I, I, I know it's it's The Simpsons and it's silly, but I think that sports does offer us some place fantasy football to try to heal at least a little bit and remember that we do occupy the same we can occupy the same space the same world together and and experience each other's presence and acknowledge each other and validate each other and 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 remember what we have in common um and and there's a lot more and look take hours upon hours to even just unpack this but a lot of people are in pain. Almost everybody's in pain. Almost everybody's been traumatized. We're not dealing with it. And um, even on a day-to-day basis in your interactions, that's one of the reasons I love New Orleans Seas, the more you can be a human being in your day-to-day interactions with all the other human beings you encounter, acknowledge their humanity. Uh, namaste. The universe in me acknowledges the universe in you. Um, maybe that's, you know, at least a little bit how you, I know we can't throw like every sand dollar starfish back in the ocean, but we can still start picking them up one by one because it's not about the story. See, you're the story writer, you're the storyteller, but it's not about the story you're in. It's about the part you decide to play. Mm, It's the audible. He's Sigma and I'm Cecil. We are the audible everyone. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay frosty. Thank you.